Welcome to the Evergreen Thumb. I'm your host, Erin Landon, a Washington State University Extension Master Gardener since 2015 and a certified permaculture designer and modern homesteader. I'm here to share up-to-date research-based horticulture and environmental stewardship knowledge to help you grow and manage your garden and to share what the WSU Extension Master Gardener program is all about. WSU Extension Master Gardener volunteers are university-trained community educators who have been cultivating plants, people, and communities since 1973. Are you ready to grow? Let's dig into today's episode. Welcome to episode 20 of the Evergreen Thumb. My guest today is Mark Amara. Mark is here today to talk to us about the link between geology and soil composition. He retired after 30 years from the United States Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service in Washington and Oregon, where he worked as a soil scientist, soil conservationist, and cultural resources specialist. Since then, he's worked as a Food Alliance Farm Inspector Certifier, evaluating dryland and irrigated row crop farms, using sustainable agricultural practices, and as a professional archaeologist. He's been a WSU Extension Master Gardener volunteer in Grant Adams counties since 2007 and the Volunteer Program Co-Coordinator since 2018. He co-authored a book on the geology of Grant County, Washington, and has written numerous articles on geology, soils, farming, and gardening. Before we join Mark, let's jump into the May gardening calendar. So working on planning in May, it's a good time to prepare and prime your irrigation system uh, for the summer months. You can use a soil thermometer to help you know when to plant vegetables. Wait until the soil is consistently above 70 degrees to plant warm season plants like tomatoes, squash, melons, peppers, and eggplants. Uh, May is also a good time to place pheromone traps in apple trees to detect the presence of codling moth and to plan a control program of sprays, baits, and or predators when the moths are found. For maintenance, it's a good time to fertilize rhododendrons and azaleas with an acid-type fertilizer if it's needed. If they are established and healthy, their nutrient needs really are minimal. It's also a good idea to remove the spent blossoms. If you're looking to select new roses for your garden, Choose plants labeled for resistance to diseases. Fertilize roses and control rose diseases such as mildew with a registered fungicide. In planting and propagation, it's a good time to plant dahlias, gladioli, and tuberous begonias about mid-month, depending on your climate. And you can also plant chrysanthemums for fall color. And it's also a good time to get started with some planting in the vegetable garden, depending on where you are and when your last frost date is. You can start getting into brassicas, um, squash, peppers, things like that, beans. Um, It's going to depend, at least in western Washington, most people wait until mid to late May, Mother's Day to Memorial Day for putting peppers and tomatoes in the ground. For pest monitoring and management, if an unknown plant problem occurs in your garden, contact your local W6 Extension Master Gardener program. If you are unsure of how to contact them, call your county extension office and they can get you in touch with the appropriate people. Managing weeds while they're small and actively growing with light cultivation uh, makes them much easier to manage. If the weed goes to bud, they're going to seed and it's going to be a lot harder to manage them, but also they have a more substantial root ball and um, so you'll be losing more soil uh, than if you pull them out when they're small. Uh, Leaf rolling worms may affect apples and blueberries, so prune off and destroy any affected leaves. Monitor aphids on strawberries and ornamentals. If present, control options include washing off with water, hand removal, or using registered insecticide labeled for the problem plant. Read and follow all label directions prior to using any insecticide. Promoting natural enemies, such as predators and parasitoids that kill or eat the insects, is a longer-term solution for insect control in the garden. Spittle bugs may begin to appear on ornamental plants as they foam on stems. In most cases, spittle bugs don't require management. You can wash them off with water or use an insecticidal soap as a contact spray. Just be sure, again, to read and follow the label directions. Other insects, like 
Cabbage worms, cucumber beetles can be controlled by hand removal, placing a barrier over newly planted rows, such as a screen or a row cover. Again, root maggots in coal crops like broccoli and cabbage, again, with row covers can help uh, prevent infestation. Monitor rhododendrons, azaleas, and primroses and other broadleaf ornamentals for adult root weevils. You can do this by looking for fresh evidence of feeding, which is notching at the leaf edges. Try sticky trap products on plant trunks to trap weevils. Protect against damaging the bark by applying the sticky material on a four inch wide band of poly sheeting or burlap wrapped around the trunk. Mark the plants now and then manage with beneficial nematodes when the soil temperatures are above 55 degrees. If root weevils are a consistent problem, consider removing plants or choosing more resistant varieties. Control slugs with bait or traps and by removing or mowing vegetation near garden plot. Monitor berries such as blueberries, raspberries, and other soft fruits for spotted wing dropsophilia. Learn how to monitor for spotted wing dropsophilia, flies, and larval infestations in fruit. A good source reference for any sort of pest management is Hort Sense, and I will link to that in the show notes. You can look up by the plant or by what you believe the insect to be. And now let's turn over to Mark. Mark, thanks for joining me today. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, your experience in soils and geology and with WSU? Okay. Um, I'm going to I've I've been gardening for almost 50 years. I've got a small organic hobby farm, and I've been a, a Grand Adams Master Gardener since 2007. For mo- for part of my career with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, I was a soil soil scientist mapping soils in Washington and Oregon, and I co-authored a book on Eastern Washington geology. My background in soils and geology has helped me relate to farming and gardening management strategies and explaining the geology of the region to the general public. Great. So can you give us kind of an overview of the geologic history of Washington and how that has kind of influenced the current landscape? Sure. Well, the short answer is that the geologic history of Washington has been influenced by plate tectonics, mountain building, folding and faulting, and erosional and depositional events over billions of years. The long answer is somewhat more complicated. Um, There were at least a dozen pieces of the crust floating on the molten mantle around the world. Here in Washington, two plates, the Continental Plate or the North American Plate, and the Oceanic or Pacific Plate are continually colliding. If you can envision it, the oceanic plate is thrusting below the continental plate, which is sinking back into the mantle. Where the plates come into contact, it's always associated with a flurry of earthquakes and volcanic activities. Around a billion years ago, give or take a couple hundred million, the edge of the continental or North American plate was along the east edge of Washington State, which means that everything to the west was in the ocean or along the coast. Sediment accumulated and became sedimentary rocks there for at least 800 million years. Then around 200 million years ago, the plates began shifting again. The shifting margin of the coastline sunk further as the continental and oceanic plates collided and a band of metamorphosed folded sedimentary rocks known as the Kootenai Arc formed in the Blue Mountains in southeastern Washington, as well as creating granites in western Montana, Idaho, and northeastern Washington. Volcanoes in the Cascades were active until about 25 million years ago. It's a little bit complicated, but there was more activity as shifting plates of the North American continent sunk into the mantle and magma pooled in the Okanagan Valley to form the Okanagan Highlands, or erupted for crack from cracks or fissures in the Earth's crust to form the Columbia Plateau. Pieces of the continents continued to reshape Washington into what is referred to as the North Cascades microcontinent, which merged with the crust to shape Washington and British Columbia. 
The present Cascade Mountains are relatively recent, having formed in the last couple million years. West for the Cascades, sediments and soils formed in oceanic crust materials, which are contrasted with the Olympic Mountains, which form from a material that was uplifted and consists of folded crustal sediments. The Willapa Hills and Puget Lowlands in western Washington are blanketed with glacial deposits from advances and retreats of the continental glaciers, which occurred four to six times in the last two million years. Eastern Washington tells a similar tale, except that the glaciers did not advance as far south as in western Washington. As the mountains rose, the climate became drier in eastern Washington. So you kind of lightly touched on, you mentioned volcanic activity, but um, are there particular areas of Washington that were more influenced by volcanic activities than others? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, the Columbia Plateau is uh, an area where lava uh, uh, erupted um, over millions of years, between 6 and 17 million years ago. And the, and the Columbia Plateau is made up of massive volumes of lava that erupted from cracks or fissures in the Earth's crust. The Columbia Plateau is represented by most of north central Washington, the west part of the North Idaho Panhandle, and northern Oregon. And it covers about 63,000 square miles uh, in that area. There were virtually hundreds of flow events, and they're stacked up, if you can imagine it, like layers in a cake. And you can see that those layers represented quite visually in the Grand Coulee, if, you, if you've ever driven up that way. Um, in some places, the bedrock layers stack one on top of another exceed more than two miles, like in the center of the Pasco Basin. Also, north of the Columbia Plateau, the Okanagan Highlands consist of igneous magma or lava that did not surface and formed large granitic masses that were exposed through erosion. You can see them now exposed up in that area and cover m most of northern Grant, Douglas, and Okanagan counties. The region is capped with windblown silts called LUS and ash or volcanic tephra from volcanic eruptions. Okay. Oh, you mentioned um, coolies, and it wasn't until recently that I realized that that was actually a geologic formation. Can you tell us a little bit more about what a coulee is? So, so coulees are kind of canyons or ravines that, that form. Um, they're actually, in, in this area, they're the result of uh, erosional events that occurred by catastrophic flooding from the Missoula floods. Okay. Well, that's a good segue right into the Missoula floods, which is what I wanted to okay, ask you about. Right. So can you tell us, start off by telling us kind of the, an overview of what the Missoula floods were? Sure. The Missoula floods originated in uh, as a lobe of the continental ice sheet block the Clark Fork River in northeastern Idaho and impounded uh, a gigantic ice dam. Uh, it, it created a, a gigantic ice dam that impounded a lake that was over 2,000 feet deep, covered over 3,000 square miles, and occupied a volume of more than 500 cubic miles, or one-fifth the size of Lake Michigan. Several times during the last two million year, couple million years, that the dam holding the water back was breached, causing sediment, ice, rock, and water to explode literally downslope to the west through the Clark Fork and Ponderé Valleys, down the Spokane Valley, into the Spokane River, into the, the, the Columbia River to outlet eventually into the Pacific Ocean. It's believed many of the early floods were pretty much confined to the Columbia River proper. It's only the most recent floods, the floods between 14 and 20,000 years ago, that uh, were diverted out into the Columbia Plateau. Okay. So, and so it, it was the outflow of those floods that helped carve the coolies? Like, yes. They, they, so, uh, um, the uh, coolies that were created in the Cheney Police Scablands and the Grand Coulee and Crab Creek and several other, there were several flood channels that, that emptied into the, into, 
uh, for example, the Quincy Basin. So we had the Grand Coulee, which is the longest, deepest, and widest channel. Then there was Crab Creek, which also emptied in the Quincy Basin. Um, Bowers Coulee, Esquatzel Coulee, and Lynn Coulee all emptied in the Quincy Basin. And what's interesting is that as all these flood channels converged on the Quincy Basin, the Quincy Basin completely filled up and the outlets were not sufficient to release the water all at once. So it backed up into the Quincy Basin, the area between the Saddle Mountains to the north uh, on the south end and the Beasley Hills on the north end, just north of Euphrata. And uh, so that area completely filled up and the outlets were not sufficient to release it all at once. So it created huge inland lakes. And um, there were eventually outlets created through the drum Drumheller channels, which are another series of coolies uh, and, and Lower Crab Creek. That's where Lower Crab Creek exits. And in three locations north of the Frenchman Hills at Crater Coulee, Potholes Coulee and Frenchman Springs Coulee. And those are all coolies that can be, you know, that are easily ac accessed now. So would the lakes, the, the inland lakes, would that have been like like Banks Lake and uh, in that area or? No, that it, it would have been farther to the south, south of Soap Lake. So a, as as material exited the Grand Coulee at Soap Lake, then it it, uh, it entered the Quincy Basin, which was, a, a you know, a, a low lying area. Okay. So in does this the floods are what created what we now know of as kind of as the channeled scablands? Is that that's the whole overall Yes. So how did all of that sediment and the outflows of the floods um alter the the soil composition? Uh, the, the Missoula floods were significant in that they plucked and gouged the the landscape throughout eastern Washington where erosion occurred it exposed bedrock, and that's the, uh, the basalt bedrock. And so the, the soils in those areas are shallow or moderately deep over basalt. And where the floods deposited silt, sand, gravel, and boulders, it's much deeper. In some areas where slack water lakes form, those are the lakes that backed up like into the Quincy and Pasco basins, the soils are relatively rock-free and finer textured, though they may have accumulated what are called erratic rocks with, embedded within it. The channel scablands exhibit a whole range of features like basin and butte uh, uh, topography, goat islands like steamboat rock, um, uh, deep coulees and canyons, mesas and hanging valleys, alluvial fans, gigantic gravel bars, ripple marks, and slack water and lake deposits, a whole range of features. The soils are generally shallow and scoured or gouged areas where bedrock is exposed, while there are thick deposits hundreds of feet thick of coarse-textured sandy, gravelly, and bouldery flood deposits and finer-textured lake and slack water deposits. Okay, so as that those floodwaters move down into the Columbia River, my understanding, there's a lot of so much material came down the Columbia that it basically continued to uh, it worked its way up the coastline. Um, th there was there was so much material that was dumped into the ocean that it did affect the ocean currents. It was it pretty much just um, created a huge alluvial fan out in the ocean. Timing speaking, I'm not sure how the Cordelian ice sheet. I don't remember if that was before or after the the Missoula floods, but um, that had more influence on the west side, correct? Uh, um, the Cordillera Ice Sheet was part of the glacial activity that, that dominated the continent in Washington State uh, in the last two million years until the last twelve to fourteen thousand years when the glaciers permanently retreated. So, um, the the continental ice sheets were. Uh, were the continental ice sheet was um, uh, were, were were part of the part of the events that um, caused the advances and retreats of the glaciers um, four to six times uh, during that two million year period. So w once the glaciers retreated and post glacial 
flooding ceased, sediments were deposited on top of the glacial deposits. In Western Washington, um, many of the soils that I dealt with, have dealt with over there, have hard pans in them. And that was created by the immense weight of the glaciers um, on the landscape. Uh, in, in many parts of the state, since uh, the glaciers retreated, uh, post-glacial flood sediments are capped with more recent alluvium, that's um, uh, volcanic ash, and windblown silts called LUS. Uh, the Palouse region is, is uh, a good example of that, of those windblown silts. And it's, it's kind of interesting that um, different soils form in different ways. Um, Western Washington versus Eastern Washington. There are five basic soil forming factors, and those are um, parent materials, climate, relief, organisms, and time. All soils form in parent materials, vary by climate and relief, are inf influenced by plants, animals, and human activities over periods of time. So it, it, they, they're all different. And it, it depends on all those factors interacting with each other to get a, a particular suite of characteristics. That makes sense. So um, how can understanding our local geology help our knowledge of the, our soil properties and the composition of the soil? Okay. Uh, recognizing and learning about the geologic formations and parent materials from which soils form can be helpful in determining what options there are in managing soils in our gardens and yards. For example, much of the Columbia Basin is in a low rainfall, high wind area with parent materials that consist of alluvium, windblown sediments, volcanic ash, flood deposits, and lake sediments, which overlie basalt bedrock. Knowing a little about the geology or stratigraphy, which was my kind of field of study, which deals with depositional processes in rock strata that occur in the Earth's crust, whether deposited by wind, water, ice, or lava, um, and uh, seeing that soils in eastern Washington consist of a lot of sand, sandy loams, and silt loams derived from various sources that erode easily if they're not adequately covered, can help determine management options. Shallower soils over basalt bedrock or those with water tables or other restrictive features like hard pans have more restrictions on use and management than deeper soils. So using practices like residue management, building organic matter with cover or green manure crops, compost or mulch, growing native and drought tolerant resistant plants and using crop rotations and minimum tillage can help minimize wind and water erosion. In the Palouse or in higher rainfall areas, using these same practices helps soils from washing off down slopes or leaching during wet areas. And these same practices are applicable to anyone who gardens to help build soil tilth, keep it from eroding and keep it healthy. Other practices like nutrient and pest management and irrigation water management are also important and can help keep soils productive and in place. Relating to soils has been kind of an easy way for me to help connect the public to issues in their yards and gardens. And so I, I depend on, on soils information as kind of the building block or the foundation of a lot of what I focus in on. Okay. Well, that's great. I know in our area, we're in the Chehalis River Valley. And so we have very gravelly loam. And, okay, um, right. So, and some of the rocks are, are quite large. So it was very, very fast draining soil. And so if you're not careful, you'll just wash all your nutrients right through the soil every year. And yes, it's true. So that's, that's the challenge of where we're at um, and with our soil type. But yeah, I'm on flood deposits myself. So. Uh, Missoula flood deposits, and it's a very rocky soil. It's a, it's quite a challenge. I'm always picking rocks. Always. Uh, so you mentioned um, irrigations. So what is? Can you tell us a little bit about the Columbia Basin Irrigation Project, or and uh, the impact that it has on the soil and water management? 
Uh, the Columbia Basin Irrigation Project was a, an irrigation project that was authorized in 1935, and it began delivering irrigation water, power, and flood control in the Columbia Basin beginning in 1952. Today, there are over 70 different kinds of crops grown on nearly 700,000 acres of land in a bunch of counties, Adams, Douglas, Franklin, Grant, Lincoln, and Walla Walla counties. So water is pumped. Uh, about three percent of the of the Columbia River it, volume is pumped out of the river at Grand Coulee, and it fills reservoirs, canals, laterals, drains, and waterways uh, throughout the area. The result of some of those canals and laterals are lined, but most are not, and the water table has risen in many areas over 150 feet higher. Uh, before the introduction of irrigation water, farming and gardening depended on wells and annual rainfall. And in our area, we're in a six to nine inch annual rainfall zone. So it, it was pretty desert-like. With guaranteed availability of irrigation water, the desert has been turned into an oasis. And the Columbia Basin has been transformed into one of the most productive farming and growing areas of Washington. Many soils that were once dry now have water tables and can't be farmed. Others are sub-irrigated and require little irrigation. Uh, irrigation systems, uh, on, at least on the farmland, have changed from real gated pipe and flood irrigation to much more efficient irrigation systems using sprinklers and drip irrigation, which uses water more efficiently and reduces runoff and leaching of soils and fertilizers. As water shortages and costs affect nearly everyone here in the Columbia Basin using irrigation water management practices and drought tolerant or native plants is becoming more of a necessity. So I know a, a tool that I've used um, is the web soil survey. And I know that's um, put out by the USDA, the NRCS. Is, um, so can you tell us a little bit about it and how um, home gardeners can utilize it to understand their soil composition? Yeah, uh, I I really depend on Web Soil Survey a lot. It's a wonderful tool for gardeners, and uh, people can learn about basic soil properties of the land that they manage or or they own. It's web based. It it, it provides maps and descriptions of, of soils all over the U.S. and it's you access it by address. You can put in uh, your personal address, section, township, and range, soil survey area. There's a whole suite of uh, of ways to, to access it. Soil scientists working cooperatively through agencies, university, and the Agricultural Resource Service mapped are mapping or, or are updating soils across the U.S. I was one of the USDA NRCS soil scientists uh, who mapped soils in Grant and Clallam counties. By learning about the soil, basic soil properties that make up any property are great ways to learn about soil properties and help guide people to maximizing its potentials. Properties like parent material, position in the landscape, drainage, texture, coarse fragments, depth to water table or bedrock, and others are really helpful and provide baseline data for all gardeners on using and managing their soils. More specific information is also available like water holding capacity, shrink swell potential, plasticity and consistency, pH, vegetation, use and management, and, and interpretations for different uses. When I worked for NRCS, and that was, that was my career, was through NRCS, uh, I informed farmers and ranchers about soils since I've been a master gardener, educating, ed educating the public about soils and providing soils information to individuals have been easy ways of connecting to clients. And everyone seems receptive to learning about soils and ways to better manage them. Yeah, the, the web soil survey was how we, when we first bought our property, we used that to know what what we were getting into and what the, the soil composition was. So we knew going in that it was gravelly and and fast draining and um so we've been really working hard to build topsoil the last five years so <laughs> sometimes that's uh kind of an afterthought when one buys a house to to look at the soil type but yeah building organic matter is 
is it seems to be a, a continual process. Right. So, and my understanding, so the the web soil survey is going to apply to native soils. So, say if you live in a housing development where there's been a lot of there's disruption of the disturbance. soils disturbance. Thank mm-hmm. you. That's what I was trying to think of. Um, it may not be totally accurate. Is that correct? That's correct. And and often the the soil surveys are accurate. It depends on on the the uh, intensity that the soils soil surveys were done. It may be accurate down to about ten acres in the best situations, unless a more intensive um, survey was was conducted. And and that's often not the case. So it, it's it's a it's a tool, but it's not the final word. Uh, ideally, you know, if you want to figure out what um, the situation is in your particular plot, uh, soil testing is the best way, is a good way to, to find out what the existing conditions are and then work from there. And if I remember right from my training, which was almost 10 years ago now, um, you can do like if you put a soil sample in water and shake it up and it'll... Um, settle out right so you can right. kind of see the the proportion the of distribution of sand silt and clay yeah yep uh let's see i think that covers my questions is there anything that you uh, would like to add no this is it has been actually pretty fun well thanks for joining me today it was a great conversation and i hope everybody learns a lot about washington geology i, I hope it's helpful for everyone i yeah i appreciate your Um, willingness to work with me on it. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Evergreen Thumb, brought to you by the WSU Extension Master Gardener Program volunteers and sponsored by the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. We hope that today's discussion has inspired and equipped you with valuable insights to nurture your garden. The Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State is a nonprofit organization whose primary purpose is to provide unifying support and advocacy for WSU Extension Master Gardener programs throughout Washington State. To support the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State, visit www.mastergardenerfoundation.org forward slash donate. Whether you're an experienced Master Gardener or just starting out, the WSU Extension Master Gardener program is here to support you every step of the way. WSU Extension Master Gardeners empower and sustain diverse communities with relevant, unbiased, research-based horticulture education. Reach out to your local WSU Extension office to connect with Master Gardeners and tap into a wealth of resources that can help you achieve gardening success. To learn more about the program or how to become a Master Gardener, visit mastergardener.wsu.edu forward slash get hyphen involved. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to stay connected with us, be sure to subscribe to future episodes filled with expert tips, fascinating stories, and practical advice. Don't forget to leave a review and share it with fellow gardeners to spread the joy of gardening. Questions or comments to be addressed in future episodes can be sent to hello at theevergreenthumb.org. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by guests of this podcast are their own and do not imply endorsement by Washington State University or the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. Mm-hmm.